so first of all, uh, hello everyone. I would like to thank you for joining us for this first webinar uh, in this series that is dedicated to bakers and millers. Um, the aim is to give you some ideas and pointers about how to master flower and dough behavior. Uh, so my name is Lena Boscobierne. Uh, I am product and application specialist for Chopin Technology, friend of KPM Analytics. And uh, today I'll be pleased to try and help you uh, reduce your need for uh, costly baking trials. So uh, during this uh, webinar, you can, uh, so yeah, during this webinar, please feel free to um, ask questions and to use the uh, question and answer option uh, that you can see here. Uh, so we will uh, go through them at the end of the webinar. And if we do not have time to answer all questions, we will contact you uh, thanks to the uh, email address that you provided um, upon registration. Uh, and we will also send you the video of the uh, recording, the video recording after the webinar, so you have all uh, information. So let's, uh, let's just start. So we need to start with the end quality in mind. Uh, we need to start by the fact that we are making bread for consumers, making biscuits or making um, waffles or, or, or donuts or whatever, but we are making final products for consumers. And so we want the consumer, we want this little boy here uh, to be happy. And we want him to ask mommy and daddy for the same product again. And, and here the key word is really uh, same product. Uh, we want him to buy the same product, not a better product, nutritionally speaking, or a different product. He wants this product because he likes this one. But in order to have this product, well, what does that mean? That means that uh, the baking process must be under control. And to have the baking process under control, the flour must be compliant with the baking process. And so that means that the milling process must be under control to, pro to provide this flour. And so the, the milling process must also requires um, of, uh, a wheat that is corresponding to its specifications. And so to have all of that, well, we need, well, everything that is going to impact the quality of flour and dough to be under control. Uh, so including the raw material, uh, the machines, the operators, the methods, the metrics as well. And this is where we can help. Uh, as an instrument company, we can help you um, by analyzing your entering raw materials. Uh, with flour and other ingredients, and we can help you uh, maintaining user satisfaction through uh, flour quality. Just to start, what is the aim of uh, testing wheat and flour? Uh, well, we know that every day when wheat or flour are purchased anywhere in the world, uh, there is a need to make sure that they meet expectations. Um, why? Why do you, we need that? Because, uh, yeah. Because for a bakery uh, or for a miller, if you buy non-performing products, you can and you will have a strong technological and financial impact. Um, well, that can mean an extra investment to correct production issues. Uh, and generally that requires technical expertise uh, with an engineer or with a master baker uh, but a technical expertise, most probably it will require different improvers when possible, because um, if in the context of a clean label production, this is not always possible to use whatever product. Uh, and in any case, the final bread product quality mainly relies on flour quality. And improvers are always uh, means uh, extra investments. Also, that will definitely lead to issues online. Product loss, uh, if the product are not compliant, production stops also, or process adjustments that are very costly because we don't produce in this, uh, in this moment. And if, um, besides all of that, we are not able to, product, to, to produce a final product that is compliant, well, there is an impact on the product properties and so on the consumer satisfaction. 
that's an issue. That's a big issue because it will directly impact the image of the product. And so our little boy will be disappointed. So this is clearly not what we want. So this is why we need to test wheat and flour. Nowadays, we use a lot of baking tests. And this is good. This is mostly seen, uh, baking tests are mostly seen as the ultimate solution to control flour quality. Because in the end, this is just a, a controlled small scale bread production run uh, that sort of copies the industrial process. And so during this test uh, that will allow to evaluate the quality and performance of wheat, flour, ingredients, the, the, the master baker can feel the dough, it can touch it, it can see what is going to happen. And so it is as close as possible to the final process. This is a great tool if it, used, if it is used efficiently and knowingly of its limits. Because just like any method, it does come with limits. Let's see just a little bit more in details what are those limits. Um, first of all, well, we can count on a few baking tests, standardized baking tests. So we have the sponge and dough method, for instance. There is the, uh, here in France, we have the baguette uh, tests. Uh, there is the RMT, rapid mix test method in Germany. Basically, we have a few baking tests like that, but they do not represent your reality with your machines, with your operators, with your tools and recipe. Those are standardized baking tests. And so of course they cannot be as they cannot be representative absolutely of your reality. So there is a bias that we need to take into account. Well, secondly, this is a test that is uh, that takes a lot of time. It generally several hours to have a baking test. And so that means that it cannot be used um, to make specification, to build specifications. Because let's say that you have a truck waiting outside full of flour. And you say to the, to the truck guy, to the driver, uh, wait here, I'm gonna make my baking test and I will tell you if I accept or not. It doesn't work like that. You have to accept and then you make the test. Also, um, you will need to use a lot of product. It requires a lot of flowers and a lot of ingredients to make a baking test. Less than a real production, of course, but still a considerable amount of raw material. And in the context of R&D trial, uh, where uh, you can sometimes use costly products, this is not ideal. Also, baking tests are usually imprecise because they are very dependent on the operator. And this is not a bad thing, but the operator is in the end just a human that is uh, influenced by his emotions and by uh, like, if, it's, if he's tired, he will not feel the, the, the things the same way. Uh, so he will be influenced by his emotion, by his state of mind. Also, this guy is an expert in what he does. Uh, he is a very high value profile. But what does that mean? If tomorrow he leaves the company, if uh, tomorrow he retires, that can happen. Well, it is complicated to fill this position. In the end, this is the person that is making the test and judging also his work. This is a subjective test. And finally, it only offer a limited understanding of what is happening. Like you can see in the end yeah, that you're going to have a bad volume, but you don't necessarily know why. Is it because the protein network is too weak? Is it because the yeast is not good? Uh, is it because there is not enough sugar? Uh, what is the problem? We don't know. We just know that the final volume is going to be bad. And so this is why we need to rely on other tests as well to complement the baking test with other tests. And so right now on the market, there are a few alternatives. Uh, here, as an example, we can see analytical specifications uh, from industry to Italian millers. And so in terms of functional properties, what we can see on this list is that 100% of uh, Italian industrial bakers, they require from their miller specifications on the protein content, on the ash content, on the Hackberg uh, index, and on the gluten content. And so 
that must mean that having these four parameters under control needs means that the flower will be performing exactly as expected. If we have those four, we are good to go. Can it be that qualifying with flower just in terms of those four parameters is enough and allows ensuring bakers that they purchase the best possible performing flower? Well, looking at my face, you can, uh, of course, uh, suspect that the answer is no. Uh, the answer is no, and I will illustrate that with, this, with an example, uh, which is based on protein content. Protein content is a very flower, is a very common flower specification, and it's a good indicator. It's easy, it's fast to measure thanks to NIR method, a near infrared method, but it does not tell the entire story. So here, this is the correlation, the results of a study that we have made uh, analyzing 150 flower samples coming from 14 different countries around the world. And they have been tested for bread making method, uh, pan bread method, uh, sponge and dough, and protein contents. What we can see is that between the volume of the, the sponge and dough uh, products and the protein flower content, there is a low correlation. There is a slight tendency but a very low correlation with an R square of uh, 0 0.16, basically no correlation. And uh, additionally, what we can see is that we can have two very similar protein contents here, 13%, but two very different volume. Or the opposite case, we can have the same volume, but with two very different protein contents. Like here we have 9.4% and 17.2% protein, and, a bay, and, and well, the same volume. So what does that uh, tell us, protein content? Nothing in the end, because the thing is, this is a quantitative parameter. It has nothing to do with quality. And plus, we do not bake protein or gluten. We bake dough, and dough is a complex system uh, with many other components interacting. So if we reduce, um, though to one single quantitative parameter, well, we miss a lot uh, of the information. Uh, we just look at a small part of the big picture. So we need to ask ourselves, what about qualitative parameters? There is an example, a very known example of a qualitative instrument, which is called the Farinograph. Farinograph is a widely used instrument giving very interesting information about the quality of the proteins, uh, meaning that it's going to give, give information about water absorption uh, capacity, about development time of the dough, about the stability through mixing, about the weakening of the protein through mixing. Uh, so very interesting. The question is, is that enough? And so if we use all of those data, water absorption capacity, development time, stability weakening, in order to predict the final volume, we have something way better than just the protein. That is true. And so we can see the importance of the quality aspect. Here we have an R square of about 0 0.45. So we cannot really speak about a good correlation, but we can speak about a good tendency. So it's way better. Question is, is that enough to have a whole picture? Is that enough to eliminate baking tests, to reduce them? Well, the thing is again, Flour and dough, they are complex. And flour is not only protein. And the fact is, the farinograph test is, is based mainly on proteins. Thing is, we also have um, fibers uh, in the flour enzymes, uh, alpha amylase, uh, other types of enzymes, sometimes proteases, et cetera, et cetera. We have um, a lot of starch, around 80% of starch. Uh, we have free sugars, we have fat, we have a certain amount of uh, water content. And so all of that will strongly impact the functionality of the flower. And all of that cannot really be seen, especially the starch, uh, the starch functionality with the farinograph as it does not allow the flower to express the starch potential because it does not heat the dough. And we can really see functionality of the starch when we heat and cool down the dough. And so this is where I would like to introduce the Mixolab. So the Mixolab um, can be seen as a universal dough characterizer. 
it is an instrument uh, with which we are going to analyze the evolution of the consistency of the dough between two blades, between two running blades, um, as a function of the time, and also a, a function of temperature constraints. So with this instrument, we are able to heat the dough and to cool it down. And so that gives us very interesting information about it. Uh, so this short introduction video, uh, where we can see here mixing bowl, water tank of the mixer lab, uh, we can also see the curve. And so at the beginning, we can see water absorption. We can also see the mixing properties, just like we would see with the farinograph, stability, et cetera, et cetera. But this is where it gets interesting. Then the temperature rises, and that gives us information about protein weakening, which is linked to the volume of the final product. Then we reach a certain temperature, stop gelatinization, which is linked to the structure of the crumb. Then the temperature is stable, very high, and at this level, we are able to see the amylase activity, which is linked to the color of the final product. And finally, the temperature goes down, and that gives us very interesting data about shelf life, about stalling of the product. So about the time during which we are going to be able to enjoy it. To give you a little bit more information about uh, all of that, this curve can be obtained using the Chopin Plus protocol. So this is a protocol uh, that contains five temperature zones. Uh, first one at 30 degrees, and then we rise to 90 degrees and we decrease to 50 degrees. And that's allow us to see a lot of different things so as I said, at the beginning, we can see the water absorption capacity. We can see the mixing properties, stability, development time, just like with the foreign graph, because we are working at constant uh, temperature. And then we are rising the temperature. Then the temperature increases. And that allows us to see, for instance, here, the protein weakening to temperature because of the temperature. And that is very interesting because it is directly linked or uh, yeah, this is linked to the final volume of the product. Because if the protein are not able to resist to this increase in temperature, basically yeah, what you will see in the oven is an increase of volume and all of a sudden a collapse. Or on the contrary, um, if the proteins are very resistant uh, to the heat, well, it will not allow the bread to rise. In both cases, in the end, the volume will be bad. So there is not a correlation, but rather a, 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 an ideal uh, here, an ideal decrease for each product. But the point is, here, thanks to this device, we can understand why the volume is bad. Then, while well, we reach a temperature that is around 55 to 65 degrees, and we start starch gelatinization, which is linked to the uh, crumb structure. At 90 degrees, we will see the starch uh, stability, the starch gel stability at high temperature, which is mainly impacted by the amylase activity. And this is important because it will impact the final color of the product. Finally, the temperature goes down and uh, this decrease, uh, it's a little bit like what is going on when you take the bread out of the oven and you let it rest on the counter for a couple of days. At first, when you eat it just out of the oven, the, this is still warm and this is great and this is crunchy, but the um, crumb is soft and so this is perfect. And then you come back a couple of days, a couple of weeks later, depending on the product. And it is not the same, right? It is hard. This is because of the starch retrogradation. And this is what we can see here in the final phase of the mix lab. So basically, this is a great indication of the stalling phase of the um, shelf life of the final product. In any case, if you want, uh, let's say that you are a farinograph user and that, OK, uh, you can see the, the value of the mix lab, but you still want to keep your reference system uh, using farinograph data, well, you can absolutely do that because uh, the mixer lab contains a specific protocol that lasts 30 minutes and that makes it possible to obtain data according to the farinograph standard. So this is what we can see here. Uh, we can see a curve very similar to farinograph one uh, with farinograph type data, with farinograph unit, just like a farinograph would give. Uh, for information, 
The Mixer Lab, with this protocol, uh, participates in proficiency testing programs such as the one organized by the BPL, along with other farinograph instruments, and is uh, recognized to be as precise and to give the same results as the farinograph. So this is what we can see here, correlation between Mixer Lab results and farinograph results. And so as we can see, the correlation at our excellence. Because of this protocol, uh, there are many people who tend to reduce the mixer lab only to an alternative to the farinograph. And um, from our point of view, this is this is this is this is too bad, because reducing the mixer lab only to that is means losing most of the benefits of the mixer lab. It would be a little bit like using your smartphone uh, the exact same way as you would use the first your first cell phone. Okay, I don't know about you. But I use my smartphone daily, uh, every hours, basically, to go online, to check social medias, to use the GPS, to, to check my emails, to do very different things that I couldn't do with my first phone. I can still make calls. And this is a little bit like that with the mix lab. You can make calls. You can have the farinograph data. Uh, this is basically the information of the first phase. But then you can also have access to much more information five times more information about uh, protein resistance, about gelatinization, about retrogradation, about um, enzymatic activity, about all of that. This is truly a gold mine of information. Now I would like to illustrate all of that with a few case studies. Um, so here the first one is about a French biscuit manufacturer. Uh, so this project, during this project, uh, we have worked with a French biscuit manufacturer who wants a very specific wheat quality uh, for making its biscuits. And so for each new crop, uh, they will test all biscuit wheat available in France. That means that in a very short period of time, they must test hundreds of samples on the biscuit pilot line, which, which consists in their reference. Additional constraint is that they run clean label. So they cannot correct with additives. So they mainly rely on wheat performance uh, to have a good final product. Based on their observation of the uh, results uh, obtained with the biscuit pilot line, they are able to rank their lots to classify the wheat lots in three types. So there is a good one, which uh, is able to give a compliant final product and no problem during the line. Then you have the bad products for one or the other reason, but they are rejected. Uh, and then you have the potentially okay. Well, we know that, okay, that, that could be acceptable with some process adjustments. So you can see that there is a need here for something a little bit more efficient in order to avoid this big lot of work every year. And so this is why we have worked with them with the Mixer Lab. And so we worked uh, with them and analyzed every wheat according to its final potential. Uh, so is it good? Is it bad? Is it acceptable? And this is what we have obtained here. Thanks to those curves, we have selected two parameters, the gelatinization intensity and the hydration that were particularly discriminant. And we were able to do that. Three classes. Good acceptable and bad. And doing that, what does that mean? Well, that means that basically, if you have a result like that, you will not bother to make a biscuit test. This one will be rejected. On the other hand, if you have a product like that, you know that this product will be good. It will be accepted. So you don't do the biscuit test either. For those one, yes, yes, OK. This one, you can do the baking test because they might be acceptable, they might be rejected. Here, there is always an uncertainty area. Uh, and at least you know what type of um, improvements you need to make to the biscuit line. That means that the R&D team can dedicate their precious time and the pilot line to work on samples that really deserve their attention, not on all samples, just on those samples that, well, yeah, we have it out. And by doing that, they have reduced by 50% the time spent during baking trials. So this is a lot. And that also allows us to see something that, that is very important. 
here, we do not say that the mixed lab can replace baking tests. Laboratory equipment and baking trials, they are two sides of the same coin. They work in synergy, not against each other. Uh, second case study here, um, little different. Here, the point is actually to predict. You have a true predicted number of the final bread volume. So I already spoken about this study. Uh, during this study, we have analyzed 150 weights coming from uh, 14 different countries. And in the example I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna focus on uh, predicting bread baking volume analyzed um, for the US official standard AACC sponge and the method. We have done that with several final process. We could do that with different kinds of things and with different parameters. So this is just an example. And we have used the mixed lab and other analytical tools, including the farinograph, in order to predict the final volume. And in order to get a good idea, a good image, well, we have used all data of uh, the analytical method of the farinograph or of the mixed lab. We have used what is called multilinear regressions. So basically, instead of only looking at one individual parameter, we have looked at all of them in order to predict a complex parameter such as the bread volume. And these are the results. Here we have the farinograph results. You can, uh, we have already uh, seen this slide and we know that there is a good tendency uh, with the farinograph to, to obtain a final volume. Can we do better? And yes, yes, because with the mixer lab, we have access also to starch behavior and to much more information. And so we are able to increase this uh, adjustment. We are able to increase the correlation uh, from a correlation with an R square of 0 0.45 with the farinograph, we are able to grow to a correlation of 0 0.66 with the mixer lab. The average difference is also lower uh, between the predicted volume and the actual volume with the mixed lab. Uh, the maximum difference is also lower, meaning that we are taking less risk predicting the results thanks to the mixed lab than with the farinograph. And now, if we take an example, very simple one, let's say I, I am a baker and I want to obtain a final volume higher than 200 and, uh, that 2,100 uh, milliliter. That's my goal. That's what I want. Well, of course, there is always an uncertainty area around this. So here I have taken 100 milliliter like that because the average difference is 71. And so by taking 100, I make pretty sure that I cover the uncertainty area. So what does that mean? That means that basically, if I take a result that is lower than that, if I obtain a result that is lower than 2000, I do not do the baking test. I reject the weight. I know that it's not gonna allow me to have a volume higher than 2,100. And on the contrary, if it's higher than 2,200 here, oh, I know it's gonna be good. I can just accept it. So basically for all of those samples, for 60% of them, there are no need for baking tests. If I do the same with the farinograph, then, well, because of the correlation is less good and because the average difference is higher, well, the uncertainty area is bigger and contains more samples. That means that we can only avoid baking tests for 38% of the sample, which is already quite good, but not as good as we can obtain with the mixer lab. And then I would just like to focus on the final case study. Uh, which is about, uh, this is different. This is about a new product development case. Uh, here, this is a project that we have done in collaboration with the London South Bank University, uh, where the objective was to develop a new formulation for healthy gluten-free muffin. So that was a PhD project. And the student in charge of this project wanted to develop a simple approach to design gluten-free products with similar rheological behavior as standard wheat flour. And final product characteristics matching the gluten reference. So basically that, that's the dream. That's everything that we want to achieve uh, using uh, gluten-free ingredients for a gluten-free formulation. 
So how did it do that? Well, it did that in several steps. The first step was to define the formulation by, by copying a standard muffin flower. So that was the strategy. Uh, it took a standard uh, muffin flower and he tried to copy its behavior. To do that, he used a clean gluten-free formulation. By saying clean, I mean no hydrocolloids and no gums. Because those products are generally labeled as uh, E something on the labels, and that's, that does not look good if you want to promote a healthy product. Uh, additionally, he didn't want to use any added starch, and I do not, that does not mean that starch is not good. That just means like, uh, like everything, you don't want to abuse it. Like if, because starch in the end is just a, it's just a big sugar. So if you're planning on running a marathon, yeah, you can eat a lot of sugar, a lot of starch. But if like me, you are planning a Netflix night, this is not so great. This is not ideal in terms of nutritional characteristics. And so to replace those products, uh, he wanted to add hemp pea protein mix. So we know that pea protein are widely used uh, for making uh, gluten-free products because they absorb a lot of water. And recent studies have shown that uh, hemp protein uh, can be used because they, they make um, some kind of a network quite similar to the gluten network actually. So not as performant, but still impressive. So the point was to, yeah, to use a mix of hemp and pea protein. And then in the end, he wanted to assess or not the usefulness of gums and added starch in this specific formulation. The second step was to confirm the formulation. And here I have to say that this entire first step that was really to make the formulation to design it was done entirely using the mixer lab. And then only a few baking tests were necessary in order to fine tune the formulation, make final adjustments and, and confirm it. Finally, it, did, uh, it checked the uh, improvement of the nutritional profile by making fiber content tests and also by making glycemic analysis with the participants who tested uh, the product. Here is the strategy a little bit more in detail. Uh, we can see here in this graphic three curves, the yellow one here, uh, correspond to the uh, muffin flour. Uh, so this is a flour with gluten. And then we have two additional flour, which correspond to the same gluten-free clean formulation. Here in blue with 100% pea protein, and here in green with 100% hemp protein. And what we can see, is that yes, pea protein, they absorb a lot of water. So very interesting. But then they do not resist very well to um, the mixing step. On the contrary, hemp protein, they absorb less water, but they give a very stable uh, characteristic to the dough. That is great. And so by using the blending low, which is a tool directly integrated in the Mixolab software, it has been possible to find the best protein blend, which corresponds to 80% M protein and 20% P protein. By using this blend, we obtain a curve that looks like that. And so, yes, it's not the same as the yellow one, but basically those curves are parallel, indicating that this is just a, a matter of hydration. We just put more water into the green curve and we reach the yellow one. Of course, uh, additional tests were performed uh, using xanthan gum and tapioca starch, which are normally used to improve rheological behavior and texture. And uh, the mixed lab results have shown that there was no significant improvement of the rheological properties, meaning that using those um, products did not allow us to get closer to the yellow curve. And the baking tests also have confirmed this statement. So in the end, we can say that a healthy gluten-free product was kind of easily developed because, well, the Mixolab results show that technological challenges could be avoided by incorporating up to 30% protein. And here it has been confirmed because, well, sensory results showed not statistical difference between the 
reference written product and the actual gluten free reference. Because in the end, only 12.5% of the participants believed that the product was an healthier option. And only 45% of them believed the product was a gluten free option. Additionally, the nutritional characteristics have been improved. The Mixolab test, the Mixolab results have shown that it was not necessary to use xanthan gum uh, or tapioca starch in the context of this formulation, and it was confirmed by baking tests. And here, uh, the uh, nutritional analysis have shown that the level of uh, fiber available was improved, and also uh, the glycemic testing. Uh, amongst the participants who ate the product showed no significant spike in blood glucose after ingestion. So very successful developments. And, and, and of course, and this is what I've been saying, uh, is that using the Mixolab allowed to save a lot of time because it reduced considerably the amount of baking tests. So the entire first phase has been done without making any baking tests which was also a good thing because it allowed here uh, the PhD student to use less sample, which in this context was very uh, interesting because hemp protein remained very expensive right now. So um, we reached the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, as a conclusion, I would like to say that uh, today's specifications are mainly being built starting from the grain and they are focusing on quantitative parameters, such as protein and ash and moisture. Those parameters are not truly predictive. They are usually complemented for having a more predictive option with baking tests. The baking tests, as we have seen, can be long, can be expensive, can be subjective. They require highly trained operators. Our proposal here is to use qualitative tools not just any qualitative tools, uh, because as we've seen, Farinograph, for instance, is one of the most used qualitative tools on the market at our disposal, but it is all about proteins. Here, to, nowadays, the Mixolab is the most complete tool on the market to analyze the dermatological properties, as it can give you all that the Farinograph can give you, water absorption, protein behavior, but additionally, starch behavior, enzymatic activity, interactions. And so at every step, you can use the mix lab in order to reduce the number of baking tests required. So uh, during new product development phase, during uh, quality control phase, and even during production, you can use the mix lab in order to save time, save sample. Of course, that does not mean that the mix lab is meant to replace baking tests again. It does not replace baking tests. It is here to, um, uh, to work in synergy with baking tests because its results will complement baker's knowledge and experience. So uh, I, I hope this uh, presentation was useful. I thank you very, very much uh, for your attention. Uh, and, uh, and I believe we can go to um, the questions. So um, again, if you have any question, please use the question and answer uh, button that you have on your screen. And uh, don't hesitate to ask any question that you want. So um, I'm gonna go check if we have uh, some already. So someone says that he needs the PDF of that. <laughs> so uh, here, I don't know about the PDF, but uh, actually we will uh, send you the recording of this uh, video, uh, absolutely. So, uh, so yes, and in the end, you can, uh, you can also uh, reach out to me and I will be happy to help you with any inquiries. Also, if you need any additional um, uh, information after, uh, don't hesitate to contact us uh, with the information that I provided here. Um, Do we have any other questions? For now, I believe that everything was very clear. But don't hesitate to uh, raise your hand or ask any question that uh, you might think uh, is interesting.
Well, if we don't have any question, that's okay. Uh, do not, again, hesitate to contact us afterwards. Oh, we have some, but not in the Q&A. Okay, that's okay. Can we please share the mixed lab manufacturers or supplier contacts? Yes, absolutely, I can. That depends on uh, where you are, actually. Uh, so uh, Chopin Technology is the um, uh, is the only manufacturer of uh, the mixer lab of the mixer lab, and it is based in France. Uh, but we have distributors everywhere in the world. Uh, so here you are in India, and uh, I can provide you with the name of our uh, contact in India. It is named the company is named Agaram, um, but uh, I can absolutely. Uh, share a more uh, precise uh, contact afterwards. Oh, I have another question. Uh, can we analyze already formed dough uh, with the mix lab uh, to be closer to the final recipe? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, yes, 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 we can absolutely do that. Uh, there is a specific tool that is called the, the well, the mix lab dough kit, uh, which is basically a chimney that we put on top of the mixing bowl and that allows us to put already made dough inside of the mixer lab. And so, for instance, you can use it online in order to make sure that your dough at different step of the process is compliant to what you expect. And if you see a deviation, then you can react react sooner instead of, of just waiting for uh, bad news to happen. So yes, absolutely. We can analyze already from the Wisdom Mixer Lab. So I can see another question from a city. Hi, city. Um, basically, Mixer Lab is the most suitable for high protein flour only. Uh, I am not sure I truly understand the question, um, but the mixer lab is suitable for any kind of flour. It is suitable for high protein wheat, for low protein wheat, even for no protein wheat, as it is suitable for gluten free products. Uh, so, um, one of the advantages of the mixer lab is that it's a very versatile tool. So, you can change anything in the, in the, the protocol. You can change the mixing speed, you can change the hydration, you can change the temperatures, and that allows us to work with a very high viability of products. Did I answer your question? Do you have any other questions? Yes, we do. Um, so when we are comparing flower qualities with mixer lab, from which moment you consider them significantly different? How much do the number need to differ? How can we interpret them? Well, that's an excellent question, uh, but I would require another 45 minutes to completely answer you. Uh, to give you a short answer, I would say that you need to know uh, the fidelity data of the measurement of the device, of the method, this fidelity data can be found uh, in the international standard of the equipment. Uh, so this is named the um, ISO uh, 17715, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but I can confirm that through uh, email. So I will make sure to contact you and to give you additional information about this topic. But basically, once you have the fidelity data, then you know what is different or not. You are welcome. So, uh, okay, I can see that we also have a question in the um, discussion. If possible, please use the, the question and answer chat, but uh, I'm still going to answer. Um, I need to know some info about the retrogradation time. I will be happy to give you some information, some information about that. Uh, I would require a little bit more information uh, as well. Uh, but basically, uh, retrogradation can be seen as in the last phase uh, of the mixer lab, so when the temperature goes down. Basically, if the torque increases a lot, 
that will be linked to a short shelf life. And if it does not increase a lot, that will be uh, linked to a long shelf life. Um, so yeah, that's the basic. And then we can enter into greater details also. So don't hesitate to contact me if you want more information. Um, I also have a question about Xentam gum. Can you tell about Xentam gum? Um, I would be happy to. But I don't. I don't really know what you want to know about this product. Uh, and I have to be honest. I'm a, a product specialist, um, but um, like a, a mix lab uh, specialist or a, an alveograph specialist, if you want. I'm, I'm not a specialist about um, bakery ingredients such as Xentam gum. I know that Xentam gum. Uh, can be used uh, in the context of gluten-free formulation or even with uh, no gluten-free formulation in order to uh, improve the rheological characteristics. But uh, it will improve the texture, the final volume, but I don't exactly know how it works. So I would advise that uh, you reach out to your provider. Um, I have another question. In nature, retrogradation needs a few days to see the results. May you explain how Mixolab shown the results within 30 minutes in the last phase? It's actually less than that. It's actually even less than 30 minutes. So, but this is this is a great question. Um, this is a great question. With the Mixolab, of course, we are not making a baking test. We are doing a shorter test than that. We don't want to make a baking test because as we have said, we well, baking tests are too long. So we needed to reduce it. So in this last phase, most of the time, it's going to be enough to have a prediction of the shelf life, of the retrogradation. But it's not going to be as precise as if you were making the bread and waiting for it to, uh, to, to change. So I know that sometimes in order to have more information about the retrogradation phase and about the shelf life, uh, some people, they change the protocol in order to uh, increase this last phase and so to have more information, more precise information about the retrogradation. But again, I would be happy to, to tell you more information. Basically, that's it. Um, I have another question. Could you explain how to predict volume of the bread uh, from uh, paranograph results? Well, this is exactly like uh, with the Mixolab. Actually, we use a statistical software that is called Minitab. Uh, and we put all the results from the paranograph. So um, water absorption, uh, stability, development time, and then uh, all the results from the baking tests. And we do the same with the Mixolab. And by doing that, uh, well, the stat we do a couple of manipulation, uh, but this is um, statistics, I'm not a statistician, but uh, basically, yeah, we do a couple of manipulation and we are able to come up with um, a formula, a mathematic uh, formula that uh, links paranograph results and bread making tests. So we use, we, we obtain a prediction through, uh, yeah, a mathematic formula. Mm -hmm. Very short answer. I have another question in the discussion. I'm not sure I answer. The means the retrogradation time below five degrees is good and long shelf life. I'm sorry, Ahmed. I don't. I don't understand the question. Can you reformulate? Besides that, uh, if we don't have any more question, I think we can um, wrap up uh, this session. Uh, if you have, again, if you have additional questions, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and, uh, and I will be happy to uh, go into greater details about all of that. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, City.
uh, Andy, thank you everyone uh, for your kind word. Um, and uh, Ahmed, I see that you would need more information about retrogradation time. So uh, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, send me an email. You have my contact here. Uh, if you can explain a little bit more in details what you want exactly, that would be great. And I would be happy to, to assist you. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for uh, all your attention and all your questions, and uh, you will receive the presentation in the next few days. Uh, have a great day and, uh, and uh, have a great uh, night if it's in your time schedule. And I will see you for the next uh, webinar that will happen in June, uh, where we will discuss what is coding a sticky dough. Uh, cracked products and other quality related issues to the damaged starch. So that's going to be in June. And uh, if you are not registered, please do not hesitate to do that now. Uh, see you then. Bye bye.